And in nine days, WWE will host its Survivor Series event, which, if the reports are true, will see the in-ring return of Randy Orton after over a year away. Orton will reportedly be the fifth man on Cody Rhodes' team in the Men's War Games match, and WWE's recent social media activity has added to the speculation. On Instagram, WWE shared a video of Orton RKOing Unico from the 2011 Survivor Series event, with the caption that you just never know when an RKO is going to pop up. Some fans clearly took this as a hint of Orton's return, and WWE promptly deleted the post, which fans also took as a sign of Orton returning, and that WWE is trying to keep it a secret. If Orton does return, it's believed that he'll be announced before Survivor Series itself to put to bed any speculation that CM Punk could be the fifth man and making a WWE return. It's been over a year and a half since fans last saw Orton compete, but that could change soon, especially if WWE's social media activity is anything to go by. This weekend, AEW will host its full gear pay-per-view, and not only will the show feature great matches, but it'll feature the arrival of a major star. On Twitter, AEW president Tony Khan announced that one of the world's best wrestlers will be at full gear, and that they will sign a contract to make them all elite. Khan gave no clue as to who this mystery wrestler is, but it likely wouldn't be someone from WWE's recent crop of releases, as main roster cuts are still waiting out their 90-day non-compete clause. Talent released from NXT back in September are available to be signed, though we doubt Khan would call one of these stars one of the best wrestlers in the world who has everybody's respect. There is the possibility that Mercedes Monet is the individual in question, as both sides have spoken about working together in the past, and it's unclear if her New Japan deal has expired. Whoever AEW's newest signing is, fans won't have to wait long to find out, and who do you think will be putting pen to paper at full gear this weekend? For some time now, somebody in MJF's devil mask has been wreaking havoc backstage, with speculation running rampant as to who is under the mask. The individual, whoever he or she may be, has had a group of masked followers and has made life hell for the AEW roster, but we now have a better idea of who it isn't. Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful Select reports that while several people know who is under the mask, the sources are doing a great job at keeping it a secret. They report, on a recent Fightful show, the panel were speculating whether or not the people that have been under the mask in the segments are actually who is planned for the eventual reveal. Multiple sources reached out to confirm that is the case, and that several people within the company know the identities, but have done well at keeping it quiet. You may remember in the case of Retribution, not only were the eventual reveals not the people under the masks originally, but the talent themselves had no idea for a while they were planned for it. Those that we've spoken to are of the belief it isn't CM Punk, and saying that it would be a huge work on those in the know if so. It goes without saying, but he hasn't been portraying the person under the mask. It was added that Britt Baker hasn't been under the mask either, so her recent comments in an interview in which she played down the idea was not a work if AEW sources are to be believed. Time will tell who will be revealed as the devil, but CM Punk and Britt Baker don't appear to be options, and we can only hope that the reveal is worth it after all this time. Last week it was revealed that Vince McMahon was ready to sell 8.4 million shares in TKO Group Holdings, with many questioning what this move meant by the executive chairman. Now we know how much McMahon sold his stock for, as a recent filing reveals that his stock sold for $76.41 per share, meaning he raked in a staggering $641,844,000 in net proceeds. While McMahon has sold a ton of stock, he still has plenty more left, as his remaining 20,435,207 shares translates to roughly 12% of the company's ownership. This transaction was made as part of an underwriting agreement dated November 9, 2023, in which McMahon participated in an underwritten secondary public offering. In layman's terms, McMahon's shares were sold at a public offering price of $79.80, but with an underlying discount and commission of $3.39 per share, hence the net price of $76.41. McMahon's ownership includes 83,102 restricted stock units, TKO RSUs, with each TKO RSU representing a contingent right to receive one share of the company's Class A common stock. There are 100 shares of the Class A common stock owned individually by McMahon's wife Linda McMahon, which he disclaims beneficial ownership of, and he and Linda are believed to be separated. 
So why did Vince McMahon dump so much stock? Well, it may have been an act of retaliation, at least according to Eric Bischoff. On his 83 Weeks podcast, Bischoff pointed out that McMahon was deemed a security risk in TKO's SEC filings due to the scandals against him that may leave potential partners hesitant to do business. Bischoff theorized that McMahon selling his stock, which led to a fall in share price and uncertainty about his future on the market, may have simply been a screw you to those who deemed him a risk. McMahon hasn't shared his reasoning for selling 8.4 million shares, and it's unlikely he ever will, but all we know for certain is that the chairman became an even wealthier man with this move. Next weekend, the Benton Convention Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina will host the WrestleCade convention, but the con will go ahead without Brian Danielson. On Instagram, Danielson revealed that he has had to pull from the con due to unforeseen circumstances, but we now know exactly why this difficult decision has been made. Bodyslam.net reports that Danielson's orbital bone injury is the reason, and that while AEW were working on a replacement, that did not come to pass. The issue was actually brought up a couple of weeks ago, as Danielson's injury reportedly means he can't fly to WrestleCade, but he's now being advertised for Dynamite and Collision that same week. Danielson can't fly to WrestleCade, but he apparently can still wrestle, although we'd suggest the American Dragon take it easy and let his broken orbital bone heal up before anything else. Over to Dynamite and ahead of his title match with Jon Moxley at full gear, international champion Orange Cassidy and his partner Hook wasted little time in sending a message. Facing Moxley and Wheeler Yuta, Cassidy and Hook brought the fight to the Blackpool Combat Club and showed the toughness needed to hang with the duo. Hook staring down Moxley, unafraid of the former world champion, enhanced the aura of the FTW champion, even if it was Hook who lost the match for his team. As Moxley and Cassidy brawled at ringside, Yuta trapped Hook in the seatbelt pin for the win, and post-match, Moxley said Cassidy is shaken ahead of full gear. The match was smart in that it preserved Cassidy and Moxley while promoting their rivalry, and it also makes Yuta a potential challenger for Hook's FTW championship. Orange Cassidy is ready to give his all against Moxley this weekend in a rematch from their all-out main event last September. That match saw Moxley win the title, which he'd later lose to Ray Phoenix, and while Moxley is one of AEW's top stars, Orange Cassidy is hardly looking forward to the match, as he told Under the Ring, It's not fun to wrestle John Moxley. When you look at that giant monster, it hurts every single time, so I'm not really looking forward to it. The feeling I'm going to have after the match, but I have a lot to prove to myself in this match. The first time that John Moxley and I wrestled, he did beat me, and it just didn't sit right with me for a very, very long time. So now I have the opportunity to get my, I don't know, it's just weird, there's like a missing feeling I have holding the championship. I don't think I'm going to be able to feel complete until I beat John Moxley. Cassidy holds the record for the longest reign as international champion, and the most combined days with the gold, but do you think his reign will come to an end at Moxley's hands at full gear? Dynamite saw a face-to-face -face between Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland ahead of their Texas death match, which would have meant more had we not seen Page put Strickland through a table a week ago. Page reiterated the stipulations for the segment, reminding Strickland that they do not include Prince Nana before laying the manager out with a barrage of right hands. Page sounded like the impassioned Hangman that fans gravitated to early on in AEW, though for all his talk, Page did little to build any additional hype to the match this Saturday. Strickland seemingly had no retort, and having one last chance to hammer his point home would have gone a long way in making their match the most anticipated of the Full Gear card. Next up, we saw Sky Blue build momentum towards Full Gear with a victory over Red Velvet, but was there any doubt in this battle of colorful wrestlers that Blue was going to beat Red? Tony Khan and the creative team have to come up with a way to rebuild Velvet, because just throwing her into the mix has not been working for her so far. Samoa Joe was up next to face John Cruz, and as you'd expect, Joe squashed his opponent, tapping him out with a coquina clutch. Post-match, Joe again offered to be MJF's tag partner at full gear against the guns and said that he is inevitable. The post-match promo was fine, but hardly necessary, and it could have been a backstage vignette or a confrontation with MJF, and seems like it was simply there to fill time. As to whether MJF takes Joe up on his offer, we'll have to wait and see, but Joe believes it's just a matter of time before he's in the ring with the AEW World Champ. Backstage, Mariah May met Tony Storm for the first time, and Storm essentially dismissed her before ordering her butler Luther to get her a warm-up match booked for Friday. It's believed that these two women will be working on screen in the weeks and months to come, so this may have been just our first glimpse of much bigger things in the future. 
As we all know, the Elite do much more than wrestle for AEW, as Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks also serve as executive vice presidents of the company. This week, however, the title of EVP was removed from the Bucks profile on the AEW roster page, with some fans questioning why the pair have been removed from the role. Well, it turns out that they haven't, as Fightful Select notes that this was merely an error which was rectified quickly by AEW. The Bucks signed multi-year contracts with AEW earlier this year, which are said to be the highest paid tag team contracts in history, and that deal will see them remain as EVPs for years to come. It was at Crown Jewel that Logan Paul captured the United States Championship, and now fans can expect to see the Maverick at another massive event next year. On Twitter, Paul seemingly confirmed that he'll be a part of Elimination Chamber Perth, and we'll have to see whether the Maverick still holds the gold when WWE goes down under. On last Friday's SmackDown, Santos Escobar turned on Rey Mysterio, and it was reported not long after that Rey will miss six to eight weeks of action due to a surgery he's been needing for some time. In a report, PW Insider said they've been asked about Escobar's heel turn, and it was made clear that it wasn't due to Rey's injury, but has been in the works for some time and always planned. Escobar is a heel, but it's a shame that he won't be able to work with Rey immediately, but expect their feud to really get going once the Hall of Famer is fully healed. Now, Chris Hero is a veteran of wrestling, but hasn't competed since March of 2020 as he chose to take a break, but that hiatus from in-ring competition will end very soon. The knockout artist will compete against fellow NXT alum Timothy Thatcher at tomorrow's West Coast Pro Wrestling event, and we'll have to see if Hero is victorious in his first match back. Up until 2011, Roman Reigns used the same theme that he used when working as part of The Shield, but if that theme sounded familiar, that's because it sounded familiar to a former superstar's music. As fans were pointing out on social media recently, The Shield's theme sounds like a slowed down version of Taz's WWE theme song, which he used from 2000 to the day he left. Ironically, Roman's current theme has been compared to the song for the hit series Succession, and no matter what theme he uses, the Tribal Chief knows how to make an entrance. Back to Dynamite, which saw the Young Bucks continue their road to Heeldom by defeating Penta El Cerro Miedo and Commander via nefarious means and earning jeers from their hometown fans. The match was non-stop action, which drew the expected This Is Awesome chant, even though there was little in the way of match narrative and a total lack of selling. The entire opening sequence was ridiculous in the worst way, as the missed leg drops and sentons and the cheap super kicks from the Bucks did nothing for the match and little for the Bucks. There was also no mention of the history between Penta and the Bucks, despite the men being involved in AEW's first event, Double or Nothing 2019, which should have been mentioned. Despite these shortcomings, the match did what it needed, with the Bucks firmly establishing themselves as villains with a pair of low blows and mocking Chris Jericho's Judas effect. A BTE trigger on Commander scored the Bucks the win, and given the popularity of Jericho and Kenny Omega as a team, having the Bucks turn heel was a wise creative move. Later in the show, a confrontation between the Bucks and the Golden Jets led to a pull-apart fight as tensions continue to build ahead of Full Gear. It'll be on Full Gear's buy-in show where MJF and a mystery partner will defend the ROH World Tag Team titles against the Guns, who faced Peter Avalon and his own mystery partner, Yuma. The Guns picked up the win in quick fashion before cutting a brief, forgettable promo on MJF, which seemed to solely be a reminder to fans that their match is happening this Saturday. It accomplished nothing, advanced nothing, and did nothing to make anyone want to see that match any more than they do, or in the case of some, do not want to. Going into Dynamite, the big match fans were excited to see was the Sega-sponsored Like a Dragon Street Fight, pitting the Golden Jets, Kota Ibushi, and Paul White against Kanosuke Takeshita, Kyle Fletcher, Powerhouse Hobbs, and the machine Brian Cage. Paul White's first match in some time saw him use the patented chops to the chest, which will never not be devastating, though Hobbs recovered by slamming White on top of a car in the parking lot. Omega hit Fletcher with a bottle and cut his hand up pretty badly, to the point that he nursed it throughout the rest of the match. A tombstone by Fletcher to Ibushi through a sign in several chairs at ringside made us think how it's impossible that such a spot can happen without hurting like hell for those involved. This was a chaotic match from the get-go, the finish was equally wild, with Jericho and Omega duct-taping Hobbs to the ropes before Omega hit the one-winged angel on Cage for the win. The crowd at Dynamite clearly had a blast with the match, which delivered what it promised, though it raises questions as to where the Don Callis family go from here. 
This wasn't the family's only big loss this week as Chris Jericho defeated Takeshita in DDT Pro Wrestling, and we'll have to wonder what credibility the family of thrown together talent have at this point. Dynamite also saw MJF appear, once again sans AEW world title, and he immediately apologized to the Acclaim and Adam Cole for getting caught in the crossfires of his run as the top star. MJF spoke about full gear and defeating Jay White to retain his championship, but the Switchblade interrupted and accused MJF of being the one in the devil mask, saying that the champ is no hero. After vowing to win at full gear, White sicked the guns and Juice Robinson on him, then laid him out with the Blade Runner before standing tall with his Bullet Club teammates to close out the show. This was an inoffensive ending to Dynamite that added little to their story, but it did re-highlight the issues between the two that has made for a compelling build towards full gear. For a man outnumbered, MJF got way too much offense in on the guns and Robinson, making them look like common lackeys, but he'll have a tougher time at full gear with Jay White, and possibly the devil himself. So that was this week's Dynamite, the final Dynamite before full gear, and what did you think? Sound off in the comments below. Over to Impact Wrestling as the company will be going through some massive changes soon, but for the time being, Impact will be going ahead without Mickey James. James is no longer listed on Impact's active roster, and sources told PW Insider that she's taking a break from the company, but the relationship between the two sides remains fine. As a TNA original and a legend of the company, Impact sources believe that James could return at any time, but for now, the former Knockouts champion is spending some time on herself. CM Punk news now, and with his career in AEW well and truly over, speculation has continued to swirl that he could be with WWE soon, but those in the company really, really don't want him. When a source spoke to Ringside News, they said, There is no interest in CM Punk. The damage he did to AEW was as bad as what Vince Russo did to WCW. Punk entered AEW to a hero's ovation, but two years and two suspensions later, he's unlikely to ever be brought back, and those in WWE hardly want a repeat of what they've seen in the All Elite Company. Each week, WWE hosts two hours of its main NXT show, and with a loaded roster for the gold brand, not everyone can be a part of the show. During this week's episode, Javier Bernal made his case for why he should have more screen time, tweeting that, This show has a distinct lack of me. Bernal's last TV match was during a September edition of NXT Level Up, and for the main WWE NXT show, you'll have to go back to July to see him be squashed by Von Wagner. Now complaining about his lack of screen time on social media may not exactly win over NXT management, and we'll have to wait and see when Bernal will be back in the ring on TV. It was only a few weeks ago that Jade Cargill appeared at WWE NXT Halloween Havoc, with many speculating that this was her move to the gold brand. That has not been confirmed by WWE, and fans hoping to see her at next week's episode of NXT will be bitterly disappointed, as the ex-AEW star won't be around. PW Insider reports that while Cargill has been frequenting the WWE Performance Center, she didn't attend the most recent tapings for NXT. Given that this taping covered both this week's show and next week's, we know Cargill won't be on the November 21st show, and it remains to be seen which brand she'll ultimately sign with. Cargill has been earning high marks in WWE so far, and is expected to do huge things when she begins competing, but whatever the future holds, it won't be at next week's WWE NXT show. As we mentioned earlier, Santos Escobar turned on Rey Mysterio last week with a brutal assault on the Hall of Famer that left Zelina Vega emotionally drained. Vega was seen crying as Escobar battered the man she considers to be both a friend and mentor, and while Zelina was shedding tears on TV, she's had nothing to cry about backstage. PW Insider has learned that quite a few people within WWE have been raving about Vega's performance during the segment, and believes she sold the impact of what was happening. Vega has done some film acting prior to WWE, and while she was under contract, portrayed AJ Lee in the Fighting With My Family biopic about Paige, now AEW's Soraya. 2023 has been a big year for Vega, from being part of the LWO to her emotional performance at Backlash in Puerto Rico, and expect big things for her as she continues to earn praise backstage. But what do you think of the segment? Were you impressed with how Vega sold the emotional turmoil of Escobar's betrayal? Let us know in the comments below. And we're ending with Jay Uso, who has had a massive 12 months from headlining WrestleMania, Money in the Bank, and SummerSlam to becoming a singles performer and splitting with his brother. 
With Jimmy Uso no longer by his side, Jay recently embarked on his first meet and greet as a single superstar and was very pleased that the event went better than he had expected. On Instagram, Jay thanked fans for coming to his first solo signing and admitted that he was nervous that no one was going to show up to see him, which was far from what actually happened. Main event Jay has been one of Raw's most featured stars and has earned high marks with WWE management and continues to impress in the ring and at the merchandise stand. WWE is said to have big plans for Jay, who is rumored to be facing his brother Jimmy at WrestleMania 40. And while this was his first solo meet and greet, it certainly won't be the last.